All right, are you ready to go into libertarian nirvana? We're ready to talk about Ayn Rand. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the three of you that are left, this is going to be great. Ari Armstrong's been a friend for a long time. Ari, good to see you again. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, on, by the way, great work on the uh, Colorado Sun. Enjoy, enjoy your column there. Yeah, that's been a lot of fun, and I'm glad that they have uh, somebody like me writing for them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I've, I recommend you specifically to a lot of people in the media that when I say you need somebody with a real libertarian mindset just to be there as a reporter, and not that you'd ever take the job, I would love for you to sit in on the editorial board meetings or simply in the, in the reporter meetings at some place like Colorado Public Radio just for a balance and you, because you've got a sharp eye go, no, you don't see what you're doing there. That's that's you're pushing an agenda. Well, I know you everybody. You know you're pushing an agenda, but you are. Everybody in the media watches your show religiously, so maybe they'll. You'll yeah, give I'm them sure. Some, I'm sure they'll give them some ideas. All right, this is the kind of geek you are. Not only do you write books, but you've got what's wrong with Ayn Rand's objectivism. So, by the way, it's a good thing you're married because this is not going to get you any <laughs> dates. All right, this is. This um, is it's definitely a niche book, and there's some techni somewhat technical discussion in it. There's all, but the first chapter I open it up with just more of a biography, some biographical information about Ayn Rand. What's her importance in the culture? So even our governor-elect, the progressive Democrat, Jared Polis, calls Ayn Rand Atlas Shrugged a great right. book. For a lot of so us, she does have a, a lot of appeal. A lot of us, and I, I'll label myself with a small L libertarian. Ayn Rand is quite often a watershed moment. You're in high school or college, and somebody throws. Uh, the fountainhead at you, and you go. Finally, somebody's seeing the world I do, and, and it's as if somebody puts puts the words you've been thinking down on a piece of paper. Um, and then and then you go and tell somebody, and they immediately call you an evil son of a bitch who's who's so selfish you don't care about the world or anybody else, and, and why you're terrible. So before we get with what you disagree with her objectivist philosophy, what do you agree with? What is it that has attracted you? What, what does Ayn Rand have right? So a lot of the reason that I wrote this is because I, I agreed with Ayn Rand for a, a long period of time, and I still agree with much of what she writes. And so among conservatives and libertarians, she's known for her individualism and her pro-capitalist politics. And so that's what a lot of uh, conservatives get out of Atlas Shrugged, even people like Ted Cruz, Paul Ryan, people like that. That's a lot of re the reason why they appreciate the book. Um, now, I, I like her general pro-reason advocacy, but of course this is a hang-up point with a lot of conservatives because Ayn Rand is a vocal atheist. In fact, her criticism of Ronald Reagan was that he was too open to the religious right. And so that's a big sticking point. And so the, I'm going to part ways with a lot of conservatives and go with Ayn Rand on some of those kinds of issues. I, uh, just to jump in, she also saw the individual as heroic. Not the collective, she saw the individual, and what a lot of us who see an individual as sovereign, that you are a king unto yourself of your own life and your own body, um, I agree with her. I believe the individual is heroic, um, not something that, that the collective has a right to, to control or coerce. And that's the part that sings to me, and I think it's the part that sings to a lot of conservatives, even if they don't agree with her on what she calls a virtuous selfishness or, um, or atheism. I think you're exactly right. And it's, it's, it's the idea that the individual, you as a person, you have a moral right to live your own life, to decide what's valuable to you, and to go for it in your life. And of course, this ties over to her capitalism, because her political beliefs are, look, as an individual, you should be free to live your life by your own judgment, to pursue the things that are important to you. And I think that all those things are, I agree with Ayn Rand on, on those points. Well, a lot of people don't get what that means. You know, they, they think in terms like a self-made man. Well, well, there he is, big self, a self-made man. No, he had workers and he had the roads and he had the, you know, a self-made man in that world is via free associations. That by working with other men, by work, and by the way, men means women as well, by working with other men, we have created all this stuff. And it wasn't a coerced relationship. It wasn't a forced relationship. It wasn't something that said you can't have a relationship. It was these voluntary interactions that we call capitalism. And a, and a lot of people forget that some of Rand's villains, many of her villains, are actually in business, but they're using right. the force of government to get cronyist subsidies and so on, special so treatment. So we're talking about the Denver Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> I'll make, <laughs> I'll keep it a little broader, John. Okay. <laughs> all right. 
but yet you say you're no longer with with the religion. You know, because once you leave objectivism, you're out of the club. You're you, you, can't, you can't come back into the church. Um, what, what, what part did you have a problem with? So I think that the way that she sets up her basic moral theory is just wrong. And so she, I want to make, I think that there's much more room in human life for incorporating others' interests into my own interests. So one big example of this is having children. So Ayn Rand advocates rational selfishness, but having and raising a child is, yes, there are personal, a lot of personal benefits I get out of this, but fundamentally having and raising a child is about doing something for another human being, i.e. my child. And so I, just, I think that there's more room in human life for the interests of others than I think what Rand theoretically allows. So stop there. She had, per, in her life, no kids. And therefore, it's like your friends that have no kids, they see the world very differently than when, when you have kids. You've got a connection to the future, uh, and you've got to take care about, about something that is completely helpless on its own. And many objectivists do have children. So for example, Leonard Peikoff, who wrote a, a the main book on Ayn Rand's philosophy has a, has a, has a child. Yeah, but he rents them out to, to <laughs> factories. <laughs> only, eight small hour, only eight hours a day, John. Yeah, this goes to no. those damn worker laws, but those um, small hands get into machinery. And so I'm, really I'm well. not arguing that objectivists you know, can't have children or can't make these selfish arguments for why you should have children or why, it's a, why raising child, a child is a selfish act. But I'm arguing that ultimately, when you look at what it's really about, it doesn't really square up with the way that Rand sets up her ethics. And so and she had uh, none of her none of her characters had kids. None of her heroic characters in her novels. The, the really main had kids. ones, the main ones, did not. Now there are some parents. So there's a mother of two joyous children in Galt's Gulch and Atlas right. So there are some. She doesn't leave it out, and she does talk a little bit about parenthood. But by and large, you're right. Chi uh, childhood, parenthood is not a not do not play big roles in Ayn Rand's novels. So. Uh, she might come back and say, you're wrong, it's still selfishness. Uh, I get more joy out of my children, and it is, it, it's selfish. I mean, I, I love being their parent, I love raising them, even when it's awful, it's hard, and when you survey parents, they say that they hate the day-to-day -day work of being a parent, but there's nothing more satisfying in the world. It is their biggest achievement. So give me another example outside of kids. Well, right, and, but, but beyond that, right, objectivists will also say, and I think this is totally accurate, that parents love their own children, not every children in the world equally, and that's a fundamentally selfish act. And they're right about that. Um, but the problem is that when the way that Rand sets up her ethics relies fundamentally on values relating to a living things, life or death. And so it's, it's fundamentally selfish in the sense that values are related to your survival. And this is where, this is the point I think where she goes wrong and where I don't think that biology squares up with, with her formal moral theory. So, but you asked for some other examples. So I think there are cases when respecting others' rights is going to be hard and not necessarily in your direct immediate interests. So when there is institutional force. Um, so for example, under slavery, is it obviously in a slaveholders' egoistic interests to release all the slaves, pay compensation, and so on? I think that's a hard case to make. Now, of course, Jeff, objectivists will try to make that case. Should we, to what degree should we give to charity? To what degree should we spend our time engaging civically, trying to save the world for freedom and capitalism, as opposed to just working at a job to directly sustain our lives? I just don't think that there's enough to, theoretical room in Rand's theory for that. So to tie that to, to reality, and we're gonna be tight on time, the United States is by far the most charitable country in the world. So these awful capitalists make gobs of money and somebody like Phil Anschutz builds a hospital on a, a campus which has saved my son's life. He doesn't have to do that. And by Ayn Rand's philosophy, he might not do that unless, of course, he gets some sort of selfish joy from doing it. Well, yeah, I think that it's hard to square with her formal metaphysics. Now, I do think that it, Rand is totally right that what people often miss is to celebrate people's productive achievements. I mean, what enabled Anschutz to fund these charitable projects? Well, fundamentally, it's because he was able to generate wealth. Why is Bill Gates one of the world's leading philanthropists? Because Bill Gates wrote Added software. Added value. And, yeah, exactly. So I think Rand is totally right that we need to focus on the production, the productivity, as a central virtue in human life, because we need to produce the values to live. But I also think that there is this other element where we, we can also celebrate people's charitable 
uh, charitable giving more than maybe Rand's uh, theor theory will allow for. I will agree with her this. We do not celebrate professional achievement. We denigrate it. We attack it. We steal from it. We see somebody who creates, and at first we're like, you go ahead and create. And once you've created enough, we're going to steal it from you and give it to the other guy. And I think she had a, her finger on the pulse on that. You're saying that when that guy also gives to charity, when he does uh, philanthropy, there ought to be as much celebration of that as... as or or at, least, at least recognizing that that as a moral endeavor, something that's important to a lot of human beings. And which is not to say that everyone has to g devote their right. lives to charitable giving, right? Um, and they had to earn the wealth again before they could give it away. Um, so, yeah, I do think that there's much more room for me in looking at my interests in recognizing the interest, how the interests of others are unfolded in my own interests. And Rand does that to some, to, in, its important, in some important ways, but I think that there's more room for that than what she allows. All right, let's just say it right here. Three years ago you had a baby boy, and now you've turned into one of them, some little soft snowflake who's turning your back on hardcore libertarian objectivist philosophy. You see, this is what happens. <laughs> You've turned, man. I remember when it was about the music. All right, where can people get the book if they if, if so interested? Just go to Amazon, or you can go to my website, ariarmstrong.com. And by the way, where else, what else will we find at ariarmstrong.com? Because this is heady. You also do politics, and I think that's the part that most people might be really into. Well, I have some introductory essays about the same, same subject, but if you want to read my latest political articles, just go to the Colorado Sun, and you can find my articles there. And I also do the free Colorado Freedom Report, so that's freecolorado.com. There's some, essays, there's some articles on there specifically about Colorado politics. All right, worth doing. And Twitter, because you're good at that as well. I got to run. Thank you. Thank you. Listen for me on KHOW Radio. Read me in the Denver Post. Check out the Independence Institute at thinkfreedom.org. We'll see you next week.